All right. How's everybody doing today? Yeah. It's going to be an awesome day. Awesome day. My name is Mark. For those of you that are joining us uh, for the first time, and it's great to be here uh, with you. We've got a really uh, interesting time in store. And before we jump into all that, let's pray. All right? I've never had anybody say, no, let's not. <laughs> so thank you for cooperating. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, God, for your grace in our lives, Lord. And God, thank you because there are things about you that we never would have known if you hadn't told us. There are things about how you love that we never would have been able to know if you hadn't sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. Lord, there's something about your power that we never would have known if he hadn't been raised from the dead and offered us a new life living with your power. And God, all the spiritual realities that are out there that destroy all of the religious arguments that seem to scream and shout sometimes, Lord, thank you that you bring clarity to the spiritual realities of what's true. And Lord, your kindness towards us that you would go to such great lengths so we could know things that would otherwise be completely unknowable to us, we are very grateful for. And Lord, we ask that you would open up our hearts and our minds to all of what you want us to see. And we thank you, God, for your determination for us to walk in the freedom that comes from knowing truth. We love you, God, and we thank you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 So we started a series last week called It's a Wonderful Life, which I love that theme. And it's like on TV like crazy. Um, and, uh, and you know the, the story of, 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 of George Bailey and, and, and George Bailey, um, he, he gets to a point of desperation. He's ready to check out. And suddenly Clarence, the angel, appears, right? And, and, and shows to George Bailey that his life made a difference. And so kind of by accident, he finds out that his life made a difference. But, but the fact is that Jesus is always inviting us to choose to live a life that makes a difference, not to stumble into it, not to kind of magically discover that we made a difference, but he invites us to live a life we're actually choosing to make a difference. And so we, we opened up with this passage last week that kind of frames all of this. And, and the Apostle Paul wrote to a young, timid pastor named Timothy these words. And I'll read this with me, okay? He said, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. And I love that phrase, true life. It's like that they may experience a wonderful life, the life that you were created to live, the life that, that God is inviting us into where it's not a life that we stumble into, it's not a life that we accidentally discover, but it's a life that we actually choose, it's a future that you actually choose to create based on the values that you say, this is what I believe. And, and I love reading the things that Jesus taught because what Jesus spent so much of his time doing is, is, is helping to gain a new perspective on life. It's like George Bailey when he realizes that, oh, my life did count for something. Suddenly, now it changes the way he sees life. And when you get a new perspective and you see how things work, suddenly it helps you to shift your values, shift what's important to you. And you begin to see things from a whole different perspective. And so Jesus, when he came, so much of what he did was to break down and destroy some of the religious ideas that have been put out there, the concepts of who God is that have been taught time and time again, the things that people often found themselves believing because that's what they were raised in, that's what they were always taught. 
And what Jesus was doing is he always gave a perspective. He told us something about God that nobody knew before. He showed us things, said things that if he hadn't have said it, we never would have known. We would have stayed stuck. And so like you look at like Luke chapter 15. In Luke chapter 15, uh, the, the, the religious people of the day are looking at him and they're like, man, he hangs out with sinners. What is the matter with him? And they just kind of have this scorn for Jesus because he's associating with the wrong crowd. So Jesus goes on to tell a few stories. Many of you know one of them was a parable of a lost coin where a woman loses a very valuable coin and she sweeps everything clean and she searches high and low. And when she finds her coin, she's like, yay, I found this coin. And Jesus is like, yeah, that coin represents somebody who's lost and now gets found. And he told another story of a, a parable of a lost son. Some of you know that one where here's a young man who looks at his dad and says, dad, give me my share of the inheritance goes and takes it and he spends it in wild living. He just wastes all that and he's standing in a pig pen because now he's flat broke and all his friends have left because he doesn't have any more money. And he's standing there feeding slop to the pigs. And it says he, that he longed for the slop that he was feeding them. And he thought to himself, he thought, thought, man, the servants in my father's household, they eat better than I eat. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to my dad and I'm going to say, dad, let me be a servant in your household. And so he leaves, and the Bible says that, that before he even made it all the way back home, his father was already waiting for him with open arms. And, and, and before the son could get his speech out, the father just took him in his arms and said, get him a new robe, get him new sandals on his feet, put my ring on his finger, because my son, who was lost, is now found. He says, we're going to have a party. And see, that was so offensive to the religious people in the day because for the religious people, it's like, no, the good people are in and the sin pe sinful people are out. That's the way this is all supposed to work. And so Jesus is telling these parables and he's saying, no, this is the reality of how much God loves. This is the reality of how God feels. Regardless of what you've been told, regardless of what you've been taught, this is the spiritual reality of who God is. And Jesus would tell these stories and the tension would just go up and up and up because the religious people, they knew exactly what he was doing. That he was setting people straight and he was really arguing against the positions that they had promoted and developed in their culture. And so the tension between Jesus and the, the religious establishment of the day was just getting worse and worse and worse. The tension would rise and rise and rise. And what Jesus was doing is he's saying, I'm trying to give you a different perspective. I'm trying to help you to see the way things really are. Because if you see the way things really are and you get that perspective, it's going to change the way that you live your life. It's going to change the way that you love. It's going to change what you love and who you love. And so he was always, always trying to shift perspective. And he let tension do what tension would do as he told these parables. And so they've been like just getting to the point where they were just about ready to, 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 to just say, I am out of here. I'm not going to put up with this anymore. And, and then Jesus is like, wait, 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 I'm not done with you guys yet. I've got another story for you. And so with the, with the religious people there in Luke chapter 16, it says this, that Jesus tells this story. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day, a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, hey, what's this I hear about you? Get your report in order because you're going to be fired. I'm giving you the pink slip. You're going to be canned. You get your paperwork into me and you're out of here. The manager thought to himself, well, now what? My boss fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches. I'm too proud to beg. I don't have calluses. I know how to play video games, but I don't know how to do anything else. How am I gonna, what am I going to do? And, and here's the fact. He's got, he's got a little bit of time. He's got a little bit of money. He's got just enough time to decide something about his future. And so it says that the manager after thinking this to himself, said, ah, I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I'm fired. So he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. He asked the first one, hey, how much do you owe him? The man replied, 
I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager told him, take the bill and quickly change it to 400 gallons. Really? Really, Jesus? Is there like some moral object to this lesson? Because if that's it, I'm not really sure what you're saying. And so the tension continues to rise. And he's like, he's like you can imagine what the, man, what, the, what, the, what the guy who owed all the olive oil is thinking. He's like, you're, you're going to let me get off for 50% discount? Okay, thank you. Um, hey, if there's anything I can ever do for you, just let me know. And, and the manager's thinking, sooner than you think, I'll be calling you for a favor. And how much do you owe my employer, he asked the next man. Well, I owe him 1,000 bushels of wheat, was the reply. Here, the manager said, take the bill and change it to 800 bushels. It's like, man, the, the manager, he's, I mean, the boss is going to be really mad when he finds out about this. The rich man, in verse 8, doesn't do what we expect. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. He admired him. Now, now you got to imagine a religious people going, okay, you've really lost me on this one, Jesus. What is it you're trying to teach us? He says the rich man admired him for being so shrewd. He was so shrewd. He was so wise. Why was he wise? He was wise because he had a little bit of money, he had a little bit of time, and he was thinking about the future. He was shrewd. He was wise. Because he was thinking ahead. And it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of the light. Jesus says, hey, look, if you believe that whoever dies with the most toys wins, man, you're all about the money. You, you're all about do you have enough? You're all about how to multiply it? You're all about accumulation? And you're good at it. He's like, as a matter of fact, you're better at it than people who believe in life beyond this earth. People that believe in life beyond this earth, they're not as good about it. They're not as focused and motivated by money as you are. And he says, so, so the children of this world are more shrewd with dealing with the world around them than are children of the light. And here's what he says. Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. Here's the lesson. You don't have to stumble into making a difference. You don't have to magically discover you're making a difference. You can actually create a future where you know that you've made a difference. Here's the lesson. You can create a future that you can use what God gives you and what he entrusts to you. And the spiritual reality, the way the universe will work is like this. Is that when you take your money and you make a difference in somebody's life that helps them to make a connection with God, there will be a reality, a spiritual reality absolutely will happen. That when you get to heaven, there are people that are going to be in heaven because of what you did. And they're going to welcome you. He's saying, this is how it works. This is absolutely real. And you know what? If Jesus hadn't told us, we would not know. And he says, this is how you should look at money. Understand that what you have can change somebody's life in a way that they are a part of your future. And so it's not a matter of, of what do I have to show for all of my work? What have I accumulated for all of my work but who, who has resulted because of my work? Who has resulted because of what I've done with money? Not what do I have, but who is there that I can point to whose life was, was touched and transformed because of what I did with my money? So there's a lady whose husband had cancer. And they were all out of options, and so... Even though they didn't have a background of going to church, they thought, you got nothing to lose. And they went to church. And they wanted prayer. But while they were there, not only did they get prayer, but they found out that there's a God who loves them, that Jesus Christ loves them, that he died on a cross to pay for their sins, 
that he loves to forgive sin and he loves to come into people's lives and transform their lives. And, and that woman and her husband opened up their lives to a relationship with Jesus Christ that day. And by her own words, she said, after that happened, she goes, suddenly my eyes were open and my perspective changed and I saw poor people all around me. Everywhere I looked. She goes, we literally never saw, I never saw them before. She goes, but all around us were children that were poor, children that were in need. She began to feed them right there, right at her house. She began to teach the kids, tell them about Jesus. But everywhere she went, all she saw was more need, more need, more need. She began to feed more. She began to feed more. She began to feed more. She began to, to, to do this. And for so many kids that eventually she ended up with 2,000 children. Listen, this is Pastor La Salette in Swaziland who we've partnered with. And Pastor Lasselet's story is that when, when God changed her perspective, suddenly she saw everything as, as important that could change the life of a child. And we are feeding those 2,000 children, you guys, because of generosity. And when, when we talk about everything over and above your regular giving, we talk about all this month and for Christmas, we're going to buy the truck that is going to deliver food to all of those kids. Let me tell you, Jesus is saying there's a fight, there's a reality that you need to understand there's a spiritual reality, and here it is. Every child who is alive and, and because you feed them, every child who then believes that God loves them, every child who chooses Jesus as their Savior, that there's going to come a day when you get to heaven, and they're going to say thank you, welcome. That every life that you touch by what you give is going to count. And Jesus is saying this is the way the universe works. This is exactly what's going to happen. So the way that you look at your money and the way you relate to your money, it really does matter. There's going to come a time when your possessions are gone and you're going to be welcomed into eternal home. So the question is, what do you have? What do you have? And how can you use it? Because really the big picture is, is your money is what you have and what you can use. Your house is something that you can use. Your, your tools, if you're good with tools, your tool's a tool, right? You can use tools to help people. There are all kinds of things that are in your possession that literally can make a difference in somebody's life when you choose that you're going to make a difference in their life. Here's another question. What do you have that can't be used? Why? Why would you have anything that God could not use to help change somebody's life. That's a whole different issue. Jesus goes on to, to say this as he's kind of helping them to, to understand what he's saying. And he's talking about how God looks at how we handle money. He says, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. Implications, if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you're not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? And he goes on to say this, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to the one and despise the other, but you cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. He says you, you can't do both. And so a few things. Number one is this, money isn't just a tool, it's a test. He's saying God is watching what you do with what you have. And he's saying, if you can't be trusted with what God is entrusting you with now, then how can you be entrusted with greater things? He's like, it's a test. It's a tool, and it's a test. How you use what you have is a test of where your heart is at. And here's the thing. Jesus talks about this. It's all through the scriptures that, that, that God re actually rewards people according to what they do with what they have. Now, you may go, well, I don't need a reward, man. I'm just grateful for God being in my life. He's already done enough for me. I don't need that. That's not even a motivation. Great. But for others, you may go, hold it. I mean, I could take something that is material, and I could, I could, that could be transformed into something that's going to be eternal. 
You mean I can take something that I can hold in my hands and tra- it can be transformed into something that's going to matter forever? I can take something that God has given me, a thing, and I can use that to help somebody's life be transformed? And he says, yes. That's exactly how it works. So, whether, so, so you may go, oh, that's awesome. That's like the best deal in town. How could I not do that? Hey, if that motivates you, then let that motivate you. Jesus says, either way, this is how it works. God sees what you do with what you've been entrusted, and he determines whether or not you can be entrusted with even more. It's, it's not just a tool. It's actually a test. That's why in January we're doing the financial learning experience. Why? Because I know everybody wants to be generous, but oftentimes the challenge is, is how do I fund my dreams and the things that God has put in my heart that I would want to do to make a difference? We're actually going to help you to be able to do that through that. And here's what I always told my boys. I said, boys, don't ever be motivated by money, but always be motivated by what money can do. Don't ever be motivated by money. Don't just get a lot of money because you can get a lot of money. But money is a powerful thing, and you can do a lot of good with it. So don't ever be motivated by money, but always be motivated by by what money can do. Money isn't just a tool, it's a test. Here's the second thing. Generosity is not a financial issue. It is an issue of your heart. It's an issue of your heart. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. You will hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Now, we may go, hold it. Isn't it like God versus Satan? Isn't it like be, you know, the whole enslavement thing? No, listen. Why does he say money? Here's why. Because the greatest competitor that God has for your heart is your money. It's your money that promises you security. It's your money that promises you peace. It's your money that promises you happiness. God says, no, you got to get your eyes off that. It's unreliable. It's the greatest competitor for your heart. And when you begin to use your money the way your heavenly father does, when you begin to see money the way your heavenly father does, it will shift the way that you relate to money, and it brings absolute freedom. When you realize, wow, God is just entrusting this to me, And he's just inviting me to join him to create this whole different future. And how we manage what we assume belongs to us reveals our devotion to the one to whom it really belongs to. And that's God. So what we're going to do is um, I'm going to ask the um, uh, people that are going to be doing the offering to go ahead and get the buckets ready. And Jesus, he continues to raise the level of tension. It says, the Pharisees who dearly love their money heard all this and scoffed at him. Then he said to them, you like to appear to be righteous in public, but God knows your heart. What this world honors is detestable in the sight of God. What he's saying is he's saying to the religious people, he says, you talk yourselves out of generosity so much, but God really does see your heart. And so we're going to do something a little different here. When these offering buckets come by, don't put anything in it. Take something out of it. Okay? One of these for every person. We're going to pass it out. Okay? Go ahead and start the buckets going. And I'm going to explain this in a moment. And we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll just go ahead and play music while this is going on. Money. Something a little more spiritual. We'll try it.
All right, everybody take one. Okay. Keep that going. Okay. Keep it going. You guys got it? Let's see, we're still passing. If you got it, hold it up. Hold it up if you got it. Okay. Still finishing up over there. Okay, cool. All right. Did you guys get it in the family room back there? You guys got it? They good? Okay. What is this? It's called a reverse offering. Okay? You can put it down. You can put it down. This represents your influence in the world. So you've got invite cards and you've got a $10 bill in there. $10 bill. You go, well, hold it. Wait, 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 wait. You know, aren't we like, what about the whole truck and all that stuff? Here's a few rules for you. You can't give this back to us. Because this represents your influence personally. This represents your devotion, your relationship with God. Can you use it for evil? Yes, you can. Can you go spend it on yourself? Can you go spend it on something you shouldn't? You absolutely can if that's the kind of person you want to be. But see, what God does is he gives us the opportunity to choose what kind of people we're going to be. And he gives us the opportunity to create a future. He allows us to be able to use what he has entrusted to us. To be able to impact somebody's life in a positive way. And you may go, but hold it, this isn't my money, you gave it to me. Well, guess what? Everything you own isn't yours either. It's all God's. And he has simply entrusted things to you. For you to use in a way that is going to help people come to know who God is. We can, any of us can use this for any reason, good or bad. But you and I are invited by Jesus to be able to make a difference on purpose, not by accident. And so here are the rules. Number one, you can't give this to us. Number two, you can't spend it on yourself. What we want you to do is this, is we want you to pray and you want, we want you to ask God, God, who can I bless? What can I do with this money that is going to make a difference in somebody's world? Maybe it's somebody you work with who's having a really bad day and you go, I'm taking you to Starbucks today because that will make anybody's day brighter. I don't care what anybody <laughs> says. Here's some, here's some options of what you might do with this. You might take somebody out who's having a bad day. You might choose to bless a family and just say, hey, put this towards your dinner. You might surprise somebody at the gas station and go, here, put that in your tank. Now, what are you going to say? Whatever you do, what are you going to say? Here's what you're going to say. I just want to show you God's love in a practical way. That's why I'm doing this. I just want to show you God's love in a practical way, right? And that's all we ever want to say. So say it with me. I just want to show you God's love in a practical way. Why are you doing this? I just want to show you God's love in a practical way. That's why I'm doing it. That's why I'm doing it. Or you surprise somebody in a grocery store who's in front of you and checking out. And you say, hey, I just want to show you God's love in a practical way. Put that towards your groceries. My pastor said I have to do this. Just <laughs> let me do it. Don't fight me on this. Okay. Or you tip extravagantly when you go out. And, and by the way, if you ever like pray in a restaurant and tell God thank you for the food, do not ever be a stingy tipper. Okay? And so you give thanks for your food and you tip them and you say, I just want to show you God's love in a practical way or write it out in a thing. And let me encourage you, it's a great time to leave an invite card. Let them know where you're, where, where you're hearing about how to live life with Jesus. And you just invite people. You could get together with your small group and maybe you all decide, hey, we're all going to double this and we're going to pool our money together and we know somebody who needs their car fixed. And we're going to make sure that their car can get fixed. We're going to make sure that they get that issue taken care of. Or maybe somebody has just experienced a loss in their life and they're really struggling and you go, I'm going to buy them flowers. And I'm just going to write them a card and just say, I just want to show you God's love in a practical way. I just want you to know I care about you. But whatever it is, you and I have the opportunity every day 
to take what has been trust, entrusted to us by God and to help people to begin to see the love of God as you express it. And when we learn how to do that, when our minds have been shifted that way, Jesus said, here's the way reality is. There's going to come a day when there are going to be people in heaven because of what you did, and they're going to welcome you. And they'll be a part of not what you have accumulated, but whose lives have been transformed because of the way that you loved people instead of money. And he says, that's the, that's the way it works. That's the way God looks at things. That's the shift for all of us. You guys up for that? Okay. All right. Cool. So I'm going to ask you to, we're going to pray in just a moment. Listen, here's what I want you to do. Whatever, however God leads you to use that, whatever creative way, you just keep your mind open. Send us an email. Let us know. What'd you do? Let us know. What, what, if it made a difference. Uh, you got our email address on your bulletin, bridgechurchfl.com. Uh, so just let us know uh, what you saw God do through it. And guys, Christmas is coming up. Huge services, going to be amazing. Great time to invest in people and invite them and to just let the love of God come through you. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the hope that we have in Jesus. Lord, we thank you that, God, there are, there are spiritual realities that we would never be able to know about if you hadn't revealed it to us, and you have revealed it to us. And thank you, Lord, that we don't have to stumble into making a difference. We don't have to magically discover if we made a difference, but, Lord, we get to choose to make a difference with you in the lives of people that you're touching. And so, God, open up our eyes. Help us to see all around us the people that are in need, the people that are hurting, the people, Lord, that, that maybe they're doing okay, but they just long for somebody to care about their spiritual journey. Lord, open up our eyes, and God, bless all of this for your glory. Continue, Lord, to shift our hearts, our minds, our values, that more and more, everything that we do, everything that we, we uh, do with our money reflects more and more you in our lives, your, our, our source of everything that we need. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. One more time. Give that up for God. Okay. Thank you, Lord.